joined by Jamie Jocelyn King, who is an online entrepreneur and marketing coach. She's a business mentor, and she's passionate about helping creatives, coaches, and course creators scale their digital businesses to multiple six and seven figures. She's also the founder of the Slay Your Business Networking series, host of the Slay School podcast, and the host and founder of the Summit of Slay. She's also a woman with ADHD that's thriving in business. And in this episode, we talk about the struggles of being an entrepreneur with ADHD and how we've turned ADHD into a superpower, what it looks like to have structure in our businesses, and how to set up ourselves for success when we're building businesses as women with ADHD. So if you are an entrepreneur, you're looking for some tips, tricks, hacks, um, then this is an episode you don't want to miss. And she dropped some really great nuggets of wisdom around building and scaling coaching businesses as well. So you definitely want to tune in to everything that Jamie has to share and offer in this episode. But before we do, I want to say thank you to our sponsor. You guys know I have been on a cross-country road trip for the last couple of weeks now, and I am on the road a lot. I'm not in my traditional space at home where I have all of my Organifi products, but they have sent me some travel sized products that I'm absolutely loving. So I'm able to get all of my superfoods, make sure I'm getting all my nutrients while I'm on the road. And that's one of the things that I absolutely love about Organifi because you guys, I have a busy schedule. Many of us do. I'm not, I'm not the only one, but it's really important for us to nourish our bodies and give ourselves the nutrients we need. And it tastes great. It tastes great. I can feel super confident that I'm getting my superfoods for breakfast, lunch, dinner. I'm getting energy. Um, and all I have to do is add it to my scoop, like one scoop or my, one of my packs into a glass of water. And I've got all the adaptogens, all the fruits and vegetables, even the medicinal mushrooms and it tastes delicious. So if you want to grab your own Organifi products, I highly recommend their um, Organifi Green, Gold, and Red package. And you can go to Organifi.com slash Tori Gordon. And if you use the code Tori20, you will get a discount at checkout. So go over and check out Organifi.com slash Tori Gordon. That is O-R-G-A-N fi.com slash Tori Gordon. Without further ado, let's jump into this episode. Jamie, welcome to the Coachable Podcast. I'm super excited to have you and have this conversation, talk all things business and thriving with ADHD. Just welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. I'm super excited to be here. I just adore you and I've loved watching your coachable journey and it's really cool to see what you're doing um, for people in this industry. Yeah, same. And I love, like when I came across your uh, content, I think it's been like a couple years now since I I think I started following you pretty early on in my, in my coaching journey. And that, that's been two and a half years ago. Now you've been doing this for about four years, I think. And so what I loved that jumped out about you specifically is how you, you speak the the language of woo woo and spirituality and like you speak to that spiritual entrepreneur, but you also bring all of the tactics and the strategy, which Mm -hmm. a lot of us who identify, um, as spiritual to some degree can struggle with at times and we're really in the Mm -hmm. flow and we want to be creative and we struggle with that piece. Um, but I'd love for you just to tell listeners a little about who you are and how you got started in this space and, um, how kind of Slay School was was born and why? All things Slay and yeah. in, in the rebrand and everything. Oh, so I'll try to keep this super short. <laughs> but basically, I um, was a serial entrepreneur, um, knew at a very young age that I didn't want to work for anyone else. So going to college was never on the books for me. It was never a desire. It was when I played sports and I thought I was going to play like D1 basketball But then when I had spine surgery, because I had scoliosis, um, I couldn't play sports anymore. And I was like, okay, well, if I'm not going to college for basketball, then why would I go? Mm -hmm. And so that kind of started. um, I had, as a kid, sold um, crafts, like sold bracelets that I had made. I had like a bracelet making business and I had, I did all the lemonade stand stuff and I sold. Sure. 
stuff at Derby. Um, when Derby would be in, you know, I live in Louisville where the Derby is held and we would sell, set up stuff and we would sell like ponchos when it rained. Mm-hmm. And I just, my mom's an entrepreneur and I was, I just knew that that life wasn't for me. Um, but I thought I would get into the restaurant business. I mean, I thought I would go into hair school. I, I went to beauty mm-hmm. school and then it hurt my back because I have a fused spine. I was like, well, can't do that. Then I went into the yep. restaurant industry and um, thought I would be a restaurant proprietor owner. Um, I had a mentor there. It was a, the only woman owner in our region and she was a very influential person in my life. Um, so I thought I would follow in her footsteps and do that. And then I was 19 and I got pregnant. So looking at the long road to success in the restaurant industry was basically looking at 10 years of 30K a year before you finally got that big proprietor gig. And, you know, then you would be making six figures. And I didn't want to work for 30K a year when I was going to be a new mom at 20. (laughs) So got the corporate job, um, you know, bought my first house when I was 21. I was a mom at that point. And... Worked my way up the corporate ladder. I applied 17 times to this corporate job, an entry-level call center job, because I I applied 17 times because I didn't have a degree to get me in mm-hmm. through the algorithm, and I didn't know anyone there. So mm-hmm. I just kept fucking trying, and I finally got an interview and got on at this entry-level job, which was just a Medicare customer support call center for a big insurance company here in the city, and... Um, you know, started off 32 K a year, got promoted, signed a one year contract and was able to weasel my way out of that and got promoted in nine months. <laughs> and then nice. I just worked my way up that corporate ladder. And by the time I was 24, I was managing call centers, um, across the country. I was traveling a lot. I was, um, doing a lot of trainings, like train the trainer trainings, um, teaching mm-hmm. leadership development, teaching supervisors, how to be better supervisors. And so I did a lot of leadership training in corporate America, and then I taught leadership in corporate America. And so a lot of my education and public speaking background comes from the fact that I traveled doing educational trainings, speaking to new hire classrooms every time we had a new hire class come out, which was all, all every month. And so mm-hmm. I would get in rooms of sometimes be 350 people, 500 people, and speaking in the room, doing a presentation at 24, and yeah. had to get people to take me seriously there even though I looked young and, um, yeah, I just worked my way up that ladder and, um, got a lot of professional business experience. I learned how business operations work cause I was an operations, um, leader. And so managing the logistics of a 500 person call center, 22 supervisors, their development plans taught me a lot, um, about, you know, real business. I don't like to say that online business isn't real business, but like how, big business works and scalability. And, um, at 23, I was struggling to keep up the pace with my corporate responsibilities. Like great. When I was in front of people, managing people, training people, teaching, educating. But when it came to like the computer stuff, the like, Oh, I need to sit down and do these reports and like be on calls. And like, I need to organize this data set and like, do this Excel sheet. And it was like so hard for my brain and I couldn't understand why. And then I got, that's when I got diagnosed with ADHD and I was like, Oh, my whole life makes sense now. Um, yeah. Yeah. It was just like, Oh, okay. And then I, yeah. then I let that be like almost hurt me instead of help me. I was so insecure about it. Like, Oh, I was, I felt validated of, oh, everyone my whole life is like, well, you're lazy or you're just, um, too distracted or you're, you're not, Mm -hmm. you won't focus or you're, you don't like, I wasn't against hard work. Mm -hmm. Like I love to work when I'm passionate about something, but I was always, I felt misunderstood by my family, my parents, my mom, like everyone was like, you're this, you're that. You're flighty. You're you're never going to make it. Mm-hmm. Spacey, yeah, space cadet. Oh, that's Jamie. She forgets everything. Or that's Jamie. She's so cluttery and unorganized. Yeah. And and I was like, oh, me, how I am is bad. Right. ADHD is bad. I can't be successful in this environment the way that it works. And so um, I went down the path of like 
Adderall. And that made me like, I'm not judging anyone that does medication. I do a different medication now. And I just started it a few months ago, but like I did not sit well with Adderall and like, mm -hmm. it made me want to drink more. It made me less productive. I felt like, cause I was like, I want to go party. I feel good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, I don't want to sit down and do the stuff I don't like. So I, um, you know, met my husband and, um, you know, we fell in love, got married and then we had a baby. And then that's when I was like, okay, I got off the Adderall cause we got pregnant and we had also had a miscarriage right before that. And so I blamed me being on Adderall or I blamed all these other reasons. And, um, once we had my son after having that loss, losing that baby, it was like, oh my God, I never want to leave this sweet boy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then he was born and my first day back from maternity leave was he was 12 weeks and I dropped him off at daycare with strangers. And then I got on a plane and flew to North Carolina to my call center. Wow. And I was like pumping my tits in a dirty airport bathroom, crying to my mm -hmm. husband saying, please let me stay home. <sighs> Yeah. Like I had this career that I'd worked my ass off for where I made really good money, but like, I, I was like, we'll figure it out. Like, I don't, I don't mm -hmm. know how to, I don't know how to make this work. So I started network marketing, <laughs> started doing okay. Beachbody, which is like a lot of stay at home moms, like looking yep. for a side hustle. So that's where I learned all of the marketing and sales. And I had been in sales before, but not online social media stuff. Right. And so I had sales experience, but not digital marketing. And so that was how I got into the marketing brand development side of things. And mm -hmm. I made that successful. Like I made it, you know, look like I was successful. I was at a certain rank in the company and I was on the market council for the state of Kentucky. So we were responsible for hosting all of the events for the super trainers and the events for the local community. And so I, that's how I got into event planning and organizing was through Beachbody. Got it. And so it all just like kind of each skill and each career led to the the thing that I was supposed to be doing. And then um, Beachbody, I wasn't super passionate about fitness. And so I started doing business consulting on the side for local businesses that were like, can you help us with our Facebook ads? Can mm -hmm. you? Because I had been running Facebook ads and I had been doing all these other things. And they were like, can you help us with this? And I was like, yeah. Absolutely. And so I started helping these local businesses and then people started coming to me like, can I pay you? Can you help me with my salon? Can you help me? I had this idea. I want to start a baking business. I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. And I kind of accidentally became a business coach and didn't really understand the coaching industry. So I was like, fuck it. I guess I got to hire a coach. So I hired a coach and then I launched the business and it blew up. Wow. Because I finally had an offer that people like really wanted because I had been building a brand for three years and not really monetizing it. I was just like posting on social media randomly. Mm -hmm. And then the yeah. Slay Coach started. Um, I launched that in November 2017 and hit 10K months my first month out and, you know, had our first event in January 2018. And that's how I got started with our networking events that we have and Summit of Slay and all the things later. So yeah, here we are today. You We've have made been on a million since, and wow, you've been like on just like this trajectory and path that I feel like now looking back, I don't know if you've had this experience, but I'm in the same place where when I look back on all of the previous experiences that I've had, all of the jobs, all of the skills like that I've learned, even my degree, mm -hmm. that at the time I couldn't see how is any of this going to fit Relevant. together. It was, it all has played a role and I, I use it to some degree and it's useful and it had a, it had a purpose in yeah. my path to where I am now. But a lot of times when you're, you're in the beach body, you know, season or you're in, you know, the call center season, you don't see how that's going to play into oh this God, bigger no. vision that you have for your life. Yeah. It's, it's nuts how they all lead to the next thing, divine timing, divine sure like intervention, act, happy right. accidents, things that you think are falling apart or really falling into place. And mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So well, we and I want to go ahead. No, we just, we had so many like serendipitous moments that we thought were the end. Like when we started this business, we started it because my daughter had infantile scoliosis and we had gotten all these medical bills that were piling up and we're like, oh, <gasps> I can't pay my medical mm -hmm. bills. This is not my fucking life. So I had been doing it on the side for a while, but had never been brave enough to launch the thing. 
until yep. we had that rock bottom, like worst case scenario moment where our daughter got diagnosed at four months old with scoliosis. Mm-hmm. And we're like, how are we going to mm-hmm. make this work financially? And I was like, fuck it. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I don't yeah. care what anybody thinks. I'm doing it. Well, it's interesting how, you know, that desperation will launch you into go mode when imposter syndrome or whatever has held you back or even, yeah, the imposter syndrome around I have ADHD and and the belief systems that we might create around that, which means I'm not going to be successful or I can't, you know, manage, manage all of these pieces. I'm not, I'm not, um, creative, creative, creative creativity is not something we typically struggle with yeah. as ADHD years, but maybe I'm not organized enough, right? I'm, um, I don't have enough of a plan, whatever it is. But then you yeah. get into a moment of desperation and you're like, here we go. Put, like, let's step on the gas. All of those yeah. excuses can't stand in the way the of door. taking care of my family. Yep. And so like- I want you to, yeah, I want you to talk about that specifically when it comes to ADHD and imposter syndrome and how those might feed each other um, and how maybe those have shown up in your life. Yeah. I mean, for me, the imposter syndrome was not knowing yet how to work with my ADHD brain um, or thinking that I had to swim upstream in someone else's creek. And I think that was the big quote from the Business Insider article that went viral this week. It was, I didn't realize, I didn't remember saying that in the interview, and I'm like, that's a really good quote. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I was like, that's what it is. It's like, we spend our lives as people with different functioning brains. I don't even like calling it ADHD. It's just our brain doesn't function at a, the, I'm meant to be out working with my hands and be with people and like, doing all this stuff at the desk is really hard for me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, being organized and planning is really a struggle for me. And I stopped trying to swim up someone else's success stream and cracked open the walls to where the water was flowing and made my own fucking stream that was going to work for me. And for me, that was, okay, well, if I am not organized, if I am not a planner or type A, or if I get easily overwhelmed when things look really complex, um, how can I make this simpler for myself? And who can I bring on board that is that way that can function and be the strength where I am weak? And so building a team, um, which not everyone has right out the gate. I didn't have it out the gate. I had to figure out a way that worked for me in my Mm -hmm. brain when I was just a one woman show. And that was creating simple to-do list tasks. And I've had this for years. I have this little post-it planner because I always make fun of myself every time I buy a new planner. I'm like, it's cute that I think I'm going to use this. Yeah, I'm buying it and I know I'm probably not going to use it. (sighs) I've done that Like, It's cute that I think that I could run like a calendar and keep up with it. Like, I, now I have a person that same <laughs> does. But in the meantime, it was like, here's my post-it notes of what I need to get done. Here's the three things that are going to move the business forward and make a financial impact. Here's the mm-hmm. three personal things that have to be fucking done. And then I can't do anything else until I check those off. <laughs> Just don't Love let it. myself do. And I minimize the distractions um, mm-hmm. in my world. But yeah, it, there's a way for people like us to make it. We just need to stop trying to be like those type A overachievers and start working with our genius and not against it. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because I used, like, I sort of identify as type A and I do identify as an overachiever, but I don't achieve in the way other people achieve, right? I have a very high standard for myself. I have a very high expectation of what I can do and the quality of what I can do and how I bring value to the world. And I have big audacious dreams for like the level of impact and what that looks like. Um, But when it comes to, yeah, the day-to-day task rabbit stuff, that feels really like heavy and and like a lot of pressure and, Mm -hmm. and it can feel overwhelming. And so like you, I've had to find what works for me. And, um, and initially it was, I couldn't try to be all things to all people, right? I had to figure out what was the the one thing I was going to 
focus on. And I've been able to expand as I've grown and as I've grown a team and, and have had other people support me. But I had to find my lane initially of yeah. like, what is my, what is my lane? What is my stream that I'm going to swim in? And mm-hmm. I'm going to be like, make myself known for. And then as that naturally expanded and, and grew, then I started building the team and, and kind of branching off into new, starting new streams. Right. Yep. Yeah. And that's, yeah. I think you said something earlier that resonated with me and it was like, we, um, being ADHD, we don't have a problem with creativity. Mm-hmm. Um, and I actually disagree okay. with that. Yeah. We have a problem with creativity because we have too many creative ideas. And because we are so motivated by a lack of like reward chemicals in our brain, mm. we are so mo- motivated to get those reward chemicals. And when you start something new, there is an overabundance of reward chemicals <laughs> that are released in your brain when you start something new. And our creativity is a blessing but is also the same double-edged sword of it is the same curse that keeps us the thing that makes us genius is also the thing that keeps us from sticking with anything long enough to make it um leave a legacy behind (laughs) and to make it lasting and to make it impactful to the world and to really produce value into the world is a slow growth thing. But when you are multi-passionate and you're always in, you're like me, I'm an overachiever too. So I learn very quickly and I become right. the best student very quickly. And that sends my brain into all of these, um, excited horm- you know, like the chemicals yeah. that are firing. It's like, okay, this is my deficiency in my brain. This is why I am always hopping from thing to thing. And once I really, this is why I create, why I have the program that I have, which is Slay School, which is creating your signature offer. And so in our program, we teach, here's the thing that's going to make you the most money, how to find your passions and skills and creating the signature offer that's going to make the most profitable return of your time and investment into creating a digital education product or a course or a consulting offer or a group Mm -hmm. coaching program here's the thing that's going to make you money so that you can follow all those little happy uh, chemicals in your creative brain and learning new things and Mm -hmm. diversifying your income through other passions and hobbies. But like first focusing on like four years, I've been doing this for four years and I'd never stuck with anything that long ever. I know. I was just like, I was laughing when you said this, when you, you know, explained why you said creativity is like that double-edged sword. We have so many ideas, but the follow through isn't there. And I was laughing because it's like my brain has all these open tabs. So does my actual computer. You should see all of the tabs it has. Same. And right Same. before this, right before this interview, I had this genius idea. I was like, oh, I need to create this, you know, uh, let me take this old um, exercise that I teach my clients and I'm going to create a new a freebie and I'm going to do this and this and how many th- things that are pending all the time yeah. and the anxiety exactly. that's induced by all- always having things pending and not finishing. And it's, it's funny just how unconscious we yeah. do this. And mm-hmm. then you're like, Oh, yeah. I, and just having you say that there's a reward system in place in my brain that's like, yes, start more things or follow your curiosity, follow that, that things that's creative, but then how well are we doing on the the follow through and the commitment over time Mm -hmm. to seeing that actually produce long-term results? And just be like me going through, um, learning about trauma, getting trauma informed, Right. Um, learning about somatics in the body made me really realize how I was avoiding the physical discomfort that I was feeling anytime things felt overwhelming or complex or hard mm. because it's like, ew, ugh, overwhelmed. That looks hard. Let's run away. And so mm-hmm. I stopped avoiding those feelings and started training my brain to look for the 
the chemical reward at the end when that is accomplished. And so we just got through um, with a big launch and that launch brings in about 40% of our revenue for the year as a company. And so I have been able to build a system where I only have to launch twice a year. Um, Systematizing with ADHD is huge for me. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, having a sales system that we can just rinse and repeat and a team that we can just plug and play whenever we want to go launch. Um, That has been really helpful for me. But also when I'm in the thick of things that look hard, when I see a to-do list, like in front of me, because like my assistant slash head coach will send me the to-do list for the day and I'm like, Mm -hmm. like, ah, I don't like it. So I started training myself on the long-term reward of making the reward big enough to be worth focusing inside of my discomfort of, Mm -hmm. okay, this is uncomfortable. I can do uncomfortable things. I can do uncomfortable things. And at the end, if I stick with this launch, if I get all these to-dos done that are overwhelming and hard for me, guess what the reward is? The reward is I get to take all summer off. Okay, great. Does that sound like, yeah, okay. It's right. a, I have to make it a big enough reward that's not super long in the future. Like when you tell someone like me, well, just work really hard for three years, then you won't have to ever work again. And I'm like, right. But you tell me I could, for the next six weeks, if you just get through this right here, you'll be able to have all summer off in three months. I'm like, okay. (laughs) Right, right. It's that negotiating (laughs) with yourself (laughs) to show up and, and yeah, yeah, be with that, like be with that discomfort. For me too, it's one of the things that's helped me break down longer term goals and stick with them is just measuring progress and seeing how much we're like moving in that direction. Um, Mm -hmm. and this is across not just my business, but my personal life, my fitness goals, whatever. It's like, okay, if I'm going to do look, do a 90 day, you know, sprint on something and really focus on 90 days, but I'm also going to see how's my progress after 30 days, after 60 days, because that re-ups my momentum because again, it feels like a reward. It's like, Oh, I'm moving. Like I've actually improved in all of these areas and it's reminding me why I want to continue to, to do it. Yep. That's, that's, that's me too. Micro goals. We set micro goals and then macro goals. Mm Mm-hmm. And then the benchmarks along the way are the micro goals to lead to the big goal at the end. But yeah, I just, I think being in a safe environment of people who are like you, it's why I talk so much about what I do because then the students that I attract typically have the same struggles. And so people feel understood. And I teach now in a way that's very like simplified step Mm -hmm. one, like, because there's a million ways you could build a business, right? Right. But like, here's the simplest way. And then you can add all that extra stuff if you want to. But here's Mm -hmm. the bare bones of anything that you need to learn and why you need to learn it Mm -hmm. and why you need to master it. And then I leave all the extra stuff for the people that want to be extra. And it's still there inside of my program. But the way that we teach it is a very like simplified, stripped down, like absolutely you have to learn these. Mm -hmm. But other than that, it's like, okay, now we can add extra stuff in later. Yeah. And so it doesn't get, I try not to overwhelm people when I teach. Yeah. I Is there anything else that you would say for those who are small business owners, entrepreneurs in this space, coaches, whoever, and also, um, either have an ADHD diagnosis or maybe they're, they're like, I'm not ADHD, but I struggle with the follow through or staying committed. Like I have this idea and then I, I quit, you know, six months in or after my first launch or after my, you know, first three launches. Cause I've seen this in my in myself, I've tried a lot of different things. Um, and I'm curious if, if there's any other advice that you give for people who to stay, um, committed and not overcommit to a bunch of different things, but how to go deeper instead of wide in their business to make that, that impact and see the Mm -hmm. results before quitting, before they actually get there. Yeah. And so, um, actually this is back to what I kind of talked about So entrepreneurs in general, and this is going to be very broad because I actually serve, this is why I don't call myself the slay coach anymore. What I teach is we're a consulting and education company and we 
actually teach all different types of businesses, physical, mm-hmm. in-person, brick and mortar product, all the things. But I am a multi-passionate, multi-talented because I have such a plethora of skill sets. Like I have, I used to be a restaurant assistant manager. I used to be a call center manager. Right. You know, like I used to um, do trainings and education and public speaking. And like I have all these multi-passionate experiences. I'm passionate about all of them. But I decided that inside of my business to look for the most profitable, valuable, meaning the offer that creates the most bang for my buck. So Mm -hmm. if you have a physical product or if you have a digital product, it's like what product offer or solution is in the highest demand that you can charge the most for Mm -hmm. that takes the least amount of time. So finding that middle ground between what is going to be the thing that is going to be scalable because most people get into a business model that's not scalable Mm -hmm. because they're they're like just doing one-to-one or they're just doing thing something that requires them to be in person or on the phone or wherever so look for the thing that is the most scalable that you don't hate and this is where my spiritual um soul sisters i'm one of the most spiritual people i know in my friends circles Mm -hmm. um But spirituality and art and creativity often look like martyrism. Mm -hmm. Martyrdom? Martyrdom. Mm -hmm. Like martyrdom. Yeah. (laughs) Spirituality, creativity, art, um, passion also looks like Mm self-sacrifice and also looks like you not eating this month. And so when I see entrepreneurs – and someone messaged me actually – a couple weeks ago asking if, she, if Slay School was right for her. She's like, I've heard you talk a lot about um, going where the biggest, the most value is and offering a solution and creating an offer that, you know, provides the most value to your audience mm-hmm. so that you can charge a, you know, a good, decent price so that you don't need, you know, to sell 500 people on a $37 course to make your money for the month. <laughs> and I, um, and she was like, but what about what I'm passionate about? What if, what if what I'm the most passionate about isn't what people are willing to spend a thousand dollars on or isn't what they're willing to spend. And I was like, well, then one, we either find the people that are mm-hmm. like Kim Kardashian would I'm sure spend $4,000 on a doggy chew toy, mm-hmm. but the average person that's following you on Instagram would not. Right. <laughs> so first, if you're super passionate about it and you know that that's the thing that you have to be doing in your soul contract, then Stop trying to sell it to the people who don't value it or mm-hmm. trying to convince people that they need it. Go to where the people are that really, really already value that and spend a lot of money on stuff like that. Or look for where your current audience is having problems and create a solution that they are willing to spend money on that you don't hate. <laughs> it's yeah. like you can pursue your passions in a way that isn't what helps you eat every month mm-hmm. <laughs> or pays the bills or pays your team or grows your income yeah or grows your wealth like that finding the balance it can't be something you hate because you won't want to do it it can't be something that you literally don't like at all Mm -hmm. (laughs) it has to be something you're at least interested in but entrepreneurship at its core is an exchange of value money and wealth not just in the spiritual sense isn't it an energetic value exchange. People give you money because they believe that what you have to offer is worth more than what they just paid you. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, they have to feel like they're getting a deal. They have to feel like it is valuable what you are doing. And so when we create as entrepreneurs, we are creators. And when we create a product or a digital product or a consulting product or a coaching package, A lot of times we create from a self-centered, self-righteous place of this is what I want to create and this is what I want to do. And I'm like, okay, but do people want that? Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's not always about you. You're, you get into business to be of service and to be Mm -hmm. valuable to people. Well, to solve a problem. People thinking, yeah, to solve a problem, (laughs) problem, (laughs) like problem, solution, supply, Mm -hmm. demand, problem, solution, basic economics, basic business 101. But somehow we forget about that when we're spiritual or passionate or multi-talented. I'm like, Mm -hmm. yeah, but like 
you're either going to starve or we can figure out the thing that matches with your skills and passions and experience that is going to be the thing that people are willing to spend money on, mm -hmm. the solution that they want to buy. And then we can live our life in a passionate way, like, you know, doing our passion, launching them at lower cost offers or figuring out the price that people would buy your passions at. Mm -hmm. Like when I see starving artists, like literal artists, I get so frustrated, but I see starving artists in the coaching space too, or in the online education space. They're like, but this is what I'm passionate about. Like, but if no one's buying it, you are not of value. You are yeah. not of service to anyone. Sure. Agreed. Yeah. And I think that that starving artist is a mentality. It's like a, also a paradigm that people live in um, and a belief system that like really drives their actions and behaviors and then pricing and how they put themselves out there, how they, all the things. Um, because yeah, if you aren't 100% solely convinced that what you do is extremely valuable, then no one else is either. Right. And they're like, Oh, this is such a commodity and you can get it everywhere. And sure. Like <clears throat> there are a lot of commodities out there and there are many coaches out yeah. there. There's many programs you could do, but like, if you don't believe what you do is the absolute best, no one else is, is either. We're just not going to be convinced. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, yep. um, a trap that people kind of fall into as well. And, and like you said, we take our eye off the ball of what is, who do I serve and what is the problem that I solve for the people that I serve? And then how do I uniquely solve it? We, we forget to speak to that about how, like, what's the problem and how do I solve it? And we talk, um, in these like broad, like, generic ways that are just super inspiring, but no one maybe is taking anything tangible from it. And that's why people don't necessarily know how you can really serve them. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And it confuses people and it confuses your audience and mm -hmm. everybody's confused and you're confused and nobody's getting rich on confusion. Yeah. <laughs> Clarity yeah. and solution oriented practices. So it's like, take the thing Figure out the thing that is going to be what people want and what you're passionate about. You don't want to do something you hate. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get misconstrued. Like, I am so in the middle on everything, but people will hear their what I say. Yeah. And they'll be like, she told me that I need to say fuck my passions. I'm like, no, I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> and then someone will say... Um, she's going to make people broke because they're heart-centered and running these heart-centered businesses. I'm mm -hmm. like, no, there's an always a, a way to find the balance in between mm -hmm. of what you want to do versus what people are willing to spend money on and sure. want to have solved for them. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. So what in your business, in your personal life, like how have you taken your relationship to your mind, your brain, how it works, your ADHD diagnosis, not let it become an identity for you. Because I think a lot of, anytime we get diagnosed with anything, it's very easy to start to identify as, oh, I am ADHD. It's like, I, I experienced the world through this way, you know, like, and how have you turned it into a superpower that's really helped you to like thrive, not just in your business, but in your personal life as a parent, um, in, in other areas as well. So working with what I have, um, has been really a initial struggle at first was, okay. I, I started reading all the books after the diagnosis of like, okay, well, how do I stop being this way? Mm -hmm. And it was like, okay, I am this way. How do I fix it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Instead of reading the books that were really like, Oh, here's how to embrace it. Here's mm -hmm. how to use it. Or putting myself in rooms with people. And now, thanks to TikTok, everyone is starting to understand how big the ADHD diagnosis is. Because and I've always believed that 50% of the population is just like me. Or 40. Or like, mm -hmm. you know, some really astronomical number. Um, and not everyone has the same coping mechanisms or tactical training. Like, on the job training to be able to work with it or learn how to work with it versus against mm -hmm. it. So I believe we're all just at different phases of figuring out how to make it work for us. For me, the biggest driving factor has been putting people around me that are different than me, mm. um, that understand and have empathy for the way that I am and aren't critical, hypercritical of, well, you really need to meet this deadline or else, 
or this is, you know, I just don't put people around me that don't understand. Mm -hmm. Um, I did a lot of like therapy and like reading books and self-help with my husband to help him understand because he didn't get it at first. So educating, you know, holding their hand through the education process of that I wasn't making this up, that I wasn't crazy, Mm -hmm. that I, you know, and it's nothing wrong with me. It's just my brain isn't meant to work the same way that my husband's brain works. I see things differently. And um, that has led to me having, putting people in place that put in the systems that I can then fit into Mm -hmm. my way. And Mm -hmm. so hiring the assistant that then came in and set up the systems and gives me my to-do list for the week. It's like, here, don't forget, here's your call with Tori in 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. (laughs) Like I have the systems in place and it doesn't take a lot of time or a lot of money. And I know that is a privileged thing to say because I have an assistant now, but I hired an assistant when I first started my business. Like that was my first big expense. It was like 500 a month. And I was like, let's do this. I need Mm -hmm. some help. And then as we grew, I started putting in place more people that put in more systems that then supported my crazy. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) No, that makes sense. So building a team, educating yourself, obviously educating the people in your life about how you're unique. And then what does like a day-to-day schedule look like for you? Do you have schedules? I mean, obviously your, your assistant like manages that for you, but how do you structure your work day in a way that works for you? Yep. So this is actually that, that article on, uh, in business insider that went out this weekend. I don't know when this is airing, but it went out in what month is this March? Is this March? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It went out in March. It came out like March something. Um, and it was like my routine. Well, she was like so intrigued. You don't have a routine and you make the money that you make. I'm like, no, I sleep until nine 30. Um, I stay up till one 30 in the morning. Um, sometimes it's 12, sometimes it's two. Like I don't have a set bedtime and I stay up and watch trash TV at night. Now there was a six month phase in my life where I was hyper, like building this business where I didn't watch TV at all. Hmm. And so I don't shy away from the fact that I hyper focused, um, which is also a blessing for ADHD. We can just hyper focus when we're really passionate and excited on something new. The problem is after that hyper focus fades, now what do we do? Right. Um, so I had that six month phase of growth where I was just working, 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 working. Then it became, okay, I took on too much and then I got too overwhelmed. And then I finally settled into a routine that worked for me that looked like, okay, this day of the week is this theme. Mm-hmm. So Tuesdays, um, I have calls, client calls, whatever. This is an exception being on a phone on a Monday. It throws, throws me off a little bit because I'm usually not on calls on a Monday, but we were trying to both find times in our schedule that mm-hmm. worked. And so Mondays are my me days where I come in and usually just sit down and focus on getting, um, I'll write my, I'll come in the office around 11 or 12. I'll do some homeschool work with my kids in the morning for a little bit, read some books. And then I will um, do my productivity tracker, which literally just is three personal must do's. I put my personal shit first. Here's because I'm managing three kids schedules, like book, Jocelyn, volleyball, whatever sure. thing. And, and then I'll write my three biz must do's. So I do that. Then I have my gratitude session midday to give me like a little pick me up boost And then I'll get into whatever work. Um, Tuesdays is like my call days. I don't do calls on any day but Tuesday Mm -hmm. unless it's like a special circumstance so that I know, okay, Tuesday, what is happening on this day. So that to-do list where I write my three personal, three business, and then three gratitudes. And then I have themed days um, where it's like this day is this day. And then I come in. And one day a month, I have a social media day where we'll create a bunch of social media content. So it's like just having themed days where I don't have other distractions or a million Mm -hmm. tabs open um, has really been like switching back and forth between, okay, I got to do 12 different types of things in one day. It doesn't work good for my brain. So my days are themed and uh, my to do's for the day, I write that day. And put them on a little post-it note because I can't do a planner or a uh, journal or whatever. Yeah, like it. I love it. So you guys, 
who are following along, set your schedule up in a way that works for you and maybe have you take calls or do meetings twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays. You have an administrative day. You do a content creation day. Um, and maybe just a, yeah, another day where you're just responding to emails or maybe writing or whatever, if you're working on a book, yeah, just re really structuring your days so that you can hyper focus on those specific tasks instead of trying to, to answer emails and then create content and then have a client call that can really set us off. And I definitely do the same thing, which has helped me so much in my business. Um, and I love, I love the three, 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 um, the three personal, three business, and the three gratitudes, because mm -hmm. those are easy. We can do three things. We can write down the three things, and then we have something that we can check off and feel like yeah. we've completed mm -hmm. at the end of the day, and which I, is really important. I always ask myself, so I have, you can't read it because it's so small. I can read it, but it says, how do you want to feel today? So I start off with that, mm. and I put the date, and then I put like a theme word for the day, and I do this like three or four days a week. And then I ask, how do you feel now? And if I'm not feeling... If it's a good day or a bad day, how it starts, if it's not a great kickoff to a day, I go straight into workout, podcast, or audiobook, or meditation. <laughs> then I'll do my brain mm -hmm. dump. If I'm already feeling good, I'll just go straight to my brain dump. So it's like, do you, when that business insider lady was like, well, what's your morning success routine? And I was like, actually, um, no, 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 I don't do that. <laughs> Sometimes I listen to personal development. But I test my temperature on what do I need that day, not what is a success box that I need to check. What do I actually need for the right. day to feel good? If I already feel yeah, good, it's why not am that I going to go do all these routine things Like if I'm already feeling great? Yeah, well, it's just like getting out of the need to be rigid in our structure and being more fluid with really – attuning to our needs instead mm -hmm. of doing the same thing every day because that's what we've been told we need to do. It's, I think it's so much more um, intuitive and, and just pr and productive when we can attune to how am I feeling in this moment? What do I need that would help me like kind of elevate that frequency, get into a s clearer space, head space, or create that clarity or that energy, whatever I'm really needing to get through, you know, this morning and, and get all the things that I need done instead of, yeah, requiring that we do five steps every single day. And, um, you know, that might not be what we need. So like, I think, not yeah, I like that everyone. attunement. Right. But also like, uh, I think people like us are afraid of structure or routine. Mm, like mm. just putting a little bit of fluid structure, like a structure that is movable. So it's like, mm -hmm. If we're water, because we're so fluid and fluey, fl fluey, fluid and flowy, if we're like this flow it, flowy, fluid people that like love to just fly by the seat of our pants and wherever the world or our intuition or our gut in the mo moment is taking us, why don't we be the lake and <laughs> be the water, be the lake, but why don't we build a dock floating in the middle of it? <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. some type of structure. We can come in and check in. Here's our dock. Mm -hmm. I'm going to sit on my dock for a little bit. And have that support. I'm going to allow this dock to support me. <laughs> like right. having a floating dock versus something that's attached that you have to walk up every day and do. Like something that's floating in the middle of our little sea and we mm -hmm. can swim up to it whenever we need it. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Awesome. Well, we're definitely going to have to link to this article um, in the show notes if you want to read all about how Jamie has been able to scale her coaching business to over a million, multi million dollars now at this point, mm -hmm. I think, and uh, how she teaches other entrepreneurs to to scale their practices as well in in the midst of also navigating ADHD. Um, this is you know so common. So many people out there. Um, experience the world through a neurodivergent, you know, brain like you and I. And, um, I mm -hmm. think it's really Im important for us to show that just because you have ADHD or I I've had friends who recently had autism diagnoses that were mm -hmm. like, Oh, this makes so much sense. And they're thriving in their businesses and they're, but they're learning how to create an environment that works for them. And in you know, in light of Women's History Month, um, I'm just glad to highlight, you know, other women who are really thriving in business that are showing 
others that it's possible to be extremely successful, do what you love, and create balance in a way that works for you in your personal and professional life, and that it doesn't have to slow you down. Uh, it doesn't have to hold you back like it did um, when we allow ourselves yep. to be an acceptance of ourselves mm -hmm. and instead of being in resistance and thinking, oh, we're not going to we're not going to be successful because of this. It's not a, it's not a death sentence. No, it's actually meant to like help you navigate the world in a way that, that works for you. Yeah. It's a call to find your own way, which is yeah. complicated, but it's possible. <laughs> mm. Absolutely. And you're showing us that it is. So how can people stay connected with you and learn more about your work if, if they want to get involved? Yeah, you can find me on Instagram at Jamie, J-A-M-I-E, Jocelyn, J-O-S-L-I-N, King. Um, formerly the Slay Coach, we just rebranded that page on Instagram. Um, and you can find us at The Slay School on Instagram. And Slay School is also the name of our podcast. And yeah, connect with me on Instagram. I love chatting. Love it. We definitely will put all of that in the show notes if you want to connect further with Jamie. And you know the best way to say thank you is to share this with a friend, leave a rating and a repeat. And if you are a review, that's how we make sure this, this show gets out to more of our episodes. Um, if you are someone who is more of a visual. Until then, thank you for tuning into the Coachable Podcast. Our still listening please go over to youtube and you can watch all go be coachable figure out life a career that works out a routine a structure for you jamie's doing it i'm doing it it's possible we love you thank you for being here jamie